Perhaps you've guessed, today is Valentine's Day. <laughs> I know that here we have very high IQ people, <coughs> along with those who have profound psychic awareness, and that's why you know. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, whatever the historical reasons for having Valentine's Day, I think these are always excuses that consciousness makes to be able to express a very special principle indeed. So I don't care what reason society wants to give a thing or history. We always can give it our own reason, and our reason will be more in harmony with the universal aspect. So if there is a day, which there apparently is, where people concentrate more on love, perhaps sometimes negatively, but still it's a concentration on love, uh, I say more power to that day, <laughs> especially after being given. <laughs> such a lovely indication, such a, an expression of this priceless treasure that nothing can ever describe, no words can convey, no communication can remotely really describe, yet something that is experienceable to a degree that nothing nothing can match, that is, love. How are you going to describe love? You know, we're into our title, don't you? <laughs> the mystical capacity to love. Okay. How are we going to describe love? Are we going to give it a shape? Are we going to give it a color? Is it something we can touch or hear, basically? Perhaps, yes. But then it's only in part, isn't it? It still isn't whatever it is that love is. Yet, just like there are certain things we know because we experience them, we know it exists because it's an experience. In the same way, no matter what anyone can say, anytime, anywhere, when we stop to analyze it, we have to be able to say, Love is. No scientist can measure it, describe it, give it its uh, color and for form or any of the things that we attempt to do, like you can water or fire, like you can anything material, yet it is. It just plain is. And all of us know that we have felt some kind of love sweep through our being sometime, somewhere. Even if perhaps a few of us sadly have to look back just to childhood. There's sometime, somewhere, we've all had the sweep of love, whatever it really is. And then there are others of us who know love in ways far more extended. It isn't a some time, some place, because we know it as something other than the world would usually think about in terms of love. So let's try to, together, not to analyze, because you cannot analyze love, but together, let's try to experience some kind of concept that is really not conceptual, but because we have no words, let's try to reach to some direct touch that would involve the idea which we have in our hearts when we use the word love. Let's together try to arrive at the Kabbalistic aspects of love, at least to some degree, and perhaps we will find before we leave this morning that we have taken out with us just a little bit of a greater measure of the capacity to love than we had before, whatever that capacity is. Because in essence, 
at least from my point of view, no matter what the capacity is to love, it isn't enough. It just simply isn't enough. I don't care what it is. It can seem to us as vast as the ocean, as vast as the heavens. It can seem to us as beginningless and endless, as infinity, as eternity. And yet, there's something in us when it has touched the principle of love, which it has been my privilege to do. There's something in us that always has to say, not enough, more, more. Now that sounds very ungrateful, <laughs> doesn't it? But I don't mean it in that sense. It's pretty much perhaps <coughs> like that inner essence that we feel when we really love someone, some one particular someone, with a degree and intensity that is incalculable, where there arises in us the need to give, to give, to give, to that beloved, no matter what we give, it's not enough. It is a need to give that could, could be perhaps in some ways described as similar to someone who's dying of thirst and has a need to drink or similar to someone who is drowning and has a need for that gasp of air. Except this, we can say, would be in reverse. There is within the human soul, it resides there, that's something which is certainly divine, and yet it is an aspect of the human. There is that something that has the capacity to thirst as completely for the capacity to give more and more and more to the beloved. And the beloved, in this case, incidentally, becomes something more vast than our concepts could begin to describe it as being. There is that divine something in us that has that capacity. And this particular aspect of our beings that has this capacity has to be developed. It's just like every human being has the capacity for a certain degree of development, say, of the muscular structure when they're younger. When they get older, they perhaps haven't got the same capacity. Still, we always have a certain capacity. And those who have this particular capacity can develop and develop and develop it till they reach this capacity. But once they reach it, they discover there's a greater capacity. For example, there's the story told of the man who started carrying a little newborn calf around. I think it's supposed to be a true one. I'm not sure started to pick up and carry a newborn calf around. And this naturally was done with ease. The calf was quite young. But he didn't stop. He kept carrying that calf around every single day for 10, 15, 20 minutes every day. And finally, the time came when he was carrying a huge bull with the same ease. Whatever his capacity had been at the time that he started carrying the calf, by virtue of exercising this capacity, it increased, it enlarged. And in the same manner, it isn't exactly the same, but similarly, shall we say. When we become aware of that special something that joy, that fulfillment that there is in what love is really all about, the joy, the ecstasy, the fulfillment in giving. 
when we develop the capacity to truly love and we exercise it, this is the important thing, Nothing, something that isn't exercised, you know what it happens, it atrophies. Something that isn't ex expressed, it atrophies. And truly, the capacity to love has to be exercised or it will atrophy as all else. And this is even a sadder thing because the less capacity we have to love, the less alive we are. And there are some who know it and some who don't. And when we say capacity to love, we mean so much more than one thing. Well, let's try to see it in terms of Kabbalah for a little bit, which really has to do with the basic <laughs> principles of the universe <coughs> as such, and to try to perhaps even see what is the universe and why does it exist. We can't give you a real why, but the closest that the masters have been able to come to try to give a reason for the universe is to say, well, let's say the universe exists because God is love. Now, there are some who will say, hey, wow, <laughs> you know, God better do something about his love nature because look, <laughs> look what you have. Look at the mess in the universe. And there are some schools of thought that say, well, now the way to experience the, the complete love of God is to sort of get yourself out, you know, uh, withdraw, drop out. After all, the material world is a very poor place to be in. Look at what it does. Look at what happens. And so there are some who seek God, who feel that spiritual aspiration would require that they withdraw from the physical universe as much as possible. And they make so many attempts at experiencing the love of God in and with this concept that is with this withdrawal. And yet, did they but know it, the thing they're really doing when they withdraw in order to experience the love of God they are actually withdrawing from the manifestation of the love of God and they are therefore making more and more of a minus in their hearts in relation to the capacity to love because denial of any portion, denial of any portion of the divine, which has to include its creation, would have to be denial of that which is the principle, the spirit of love. If you love another person, any time you express some denial of them, aren't you rejecting some part of them? Well, in the same way, if we but would come to recognize this, any time that we reject portions of the outer world, or what appears like the outer world, we're doing a similar thing. And so we are, in essence, damaging our capacity to recognize the reality behind the outer appearance. Therefore, in Kabbalah, we are told <coughs> the entire universe exists because God is love. And the idea of the universe, incidentally, has to do with the infinite number of expressions of the uniqueness of the divine. And it has to do with the development and evolution of centers of this divine so that they can come to see that everything is one. Now, when we use the word one, O-N-E. We're using a word that also means unity. And when, we're u when we are using the word unity, we're talking about the one divine I am, which when we chant, we chant it as a heya. And we are therefore also making a declaration. And what is this declaration? We are declaring 
that everything that exists is in union with God. That means everything that exists is in union with everything else that exists. And what is union? What is union? Union is love. Now then, if we are not able to experience this love, which very obviously we are not, <laughs> uh, more often than not, it's only because we have not yet evolved to the capacity where we can see the expression, the manifestation of love wherever we look, where we have not yet come to recognize that there is naught else except love. And this is mainly because we have come to interpret discomfort with lack of love and things that are comfortable as manifestation of love. For example, if we have good fortune, we decide fortune loves us. If we have what we think of as bad fortune, we decide fortune hates us. And that's the opposite of love. If we are receiving something that we've wanted a great deal. We say, ah, whoever gave it or whatever gave it loves us, is being kind to us. And if we find something that we thought we liked or want taken away from us, we say, ah, that someone or something doesn't like us or love us. So if we have unhappiness of any kind, we decide, this visitation of misfortune or unhappiness is an expression of non-love. And if we have happiness or fortune, we decide, ah, this is an expression of love, so that we figure, ah, God is good to us. Thank you, God. That is if we, when we remember to, if we suddenly come into a little extra money or uh, we come into some other kind of extra good fortune or receive some kind of gift or some kind of attention. We're just flowing with gratitude and we say God loves us. However, if we discover that somebody has betrayed us or many somebodies, or if the powers that be, the winds or the earth or the fire, the elements, have torn and rent some portion of our material being, whether it be things we possess or the vehicle, that we, which is also a thing, though we don't know it, but it's a glorious thing. Uh, if something occurs there, we go into a state of mind and heart where we figure we're, we're being punished instead of being loved. We're being punished. We come to think that love is being indulged. And any time any misfortune is there, we're simply in an expression of non-love. We're uh, being punished for badness, and we certainly do not feel loved. We therefore do not feel secure. And this has to do with our interactions, our relationships with people, to an extraordinary degree, of course. We keep hunting for actions to indicate how much that person loves us and how much that person doesn't love us. And most of the time we're more concentrated on finding proof of their not loving us. I remember how startled I was. A few of you may have heard this, but I was certainly startled when I was telling our beloved and extraordinary soul, Dr. Paul Foster Case, I was confiding some experience to him when I had been a child, and I was telling him, you know, there I was, I was boarding with this couple through all these years of my childhood, uh, and uh, the woman used to say, I love uh, Anne as much as I love my own daughter. She had a daughter several years older than I was. And she used to sit with the neighbors, I told Dr. Case, and she used to tell them, and I used to watch this expression of exalted uh, nobility on her face. And I actually, uh, at first, uh, accepted what she was saying, but then I started to watch. 
and I noticed that though she said she loved me as much as her own daughter, once there was some milk that had been standing, and I wanted that particular milk, and she said, no, you can't have that milk. That milk is for Ida. And I said, for Ida? And I knew this. Uh, she said, yes, yes, this is the milk that, that I've saved for Ida. Here, this is the milk that's yours. And the milk she saved for Ida was from the top of the milk bottle that had the cream. And the one for me was from the bottom. And I looked at her in shock. She didn't recognize it. She wasn't paying attention. I remember saying to Dr. Case, and I said, thought to myself, hmm. she says she loves me as much as she does Ida, but she gives Ida the cream and she gives me the skim milk, some love. Now, at this point, I was expecting Dr. Case to sympathize with me and say, oh, you wonderful, noble girl, what you've been through. <laughs> and what he said was, what a perverted mind you had. <laughs> uh, this startled me. Actually, believe me, I can assure you, I was not upset. Now, the reason I was not upset is because, remember, I'd already been doing quite a bit of work on myself with the tarot, with the tree of what, with our methods. And I really wanted reality beyond all else. I really wanted reality. When you really want reality, my darlings, you do not get upset when someone brings something to your attention. You're willing to look at it and see, is this so or not? Perhaps that is a secret I've just given you that is the most important thing I'll have to say this morning. <laughs> so don't underestimate it. Well, I was startled, and I looked at what he said. And I, I was, I thought, uh, I thought this was quite extraordinary. I knew Dr. Case loved me because I'd seen love looking out at me from behind his eyes. And yeah, as far as I was concerned, I couldn't mistake that, and I couldn't, and I don't. I know how to recognize it, and so do you. We all do, really. And so I stopped and I thought, and I thought, what is it? Ah! Here I've been going through these many years with an attitude, with a point of view that had been concentrated on the fact that nobody had loved me. Nobody. All through my childhood, all through my adolescence, and through most of my adulthood, and if I had been a little bit, it was certainly an inferior kind of being loved, as compared to what I wanted, thought I needed, and was prepared to give. Now, this was my point of view, and it was based on what anyone who looks at the outer area would agree was valid reason. That is, if we look at the outer point of view. So I had gone through all of these years with a point of view that was very profound and deep-seated indeed. The point of view was nobody loved me when I was an infant, nobody loved me when I was a baby, nobody loved me when I was a child, nobody loved me when I was an adolescent, a few people have had uh, have had uh, a sort of uh, affection for me, a few, very few, certainly too few. You know, it's always too few. You understand that, no matter how many it is. <laughs> if a little is good, a lot's better. <laughs> so it's always good. No. And right up to that point, even though I had experienced cosmic love, but you see, having certain experiences maybe one thing, having transmuted the personality to the degree where it can express 
these principles and these experiences is another. And this perhaps is one of the greatest differences between the training we receive from some schools of thought and the Kabbalah, the Western Mystery Training System. Because from our point of view, being able to experience a principle, it's important, necessary, and we work towards it. But then that is only a beginning. We have to go to work to train every atom of our bodies to become an expressing instrument for that principle. Otherwise, we're going to lose the real meaning and perhaps even the essence of the experience. It's like not carrying that calf around <laughs> until it's bull, <laughs> increasing the capacity, in other words. We all think that if we can touch God or experience God, that's it, we have it made. But you see, that isn't so. It is a step. We have to want God beyond all else. But after wanting God beyond all else, my loves, what we should be wanting is to express God beyond all else to express it. If we can't express a thing, what is it? It will die. It will atrophy. That is our capacity to touch anything. And so we come to the mystical capacity to love. What is it? Kabbalistically then, we know that it is something infinitely more than most people recognize. And we also know that no amount of happiness in things or in the, th in the areas that people think happiness comes from, no amount of this brings real happiness, certainly not lasting happiness, except being able to develop the capacity to express the divine beingness. God is love, it has been said. Now what does that mean? God is love. Words. Usually, we think what it means is that we're loved by God then. But it, that isn't what it means at all. Certainly we're loved by God whether we know it or not. But God is love means something fantastically more. What it means is, if God is love, then not until I am love am I remotely doing what God has been creating me to do. You have heard me say this. You have read it in various ways. You have heard, I am that I am, and then God is love. But have we recognized the importance of tying it up together? I am love. Right? What is it to be love? What? Let our imaginations wander around a little bit. What is it? For instance, say to yourself, I am love. Right? If I am love, how would I think? All right, I am love. How would I think? How would I think about other races, other countries, if I am love? I am love, then. How would I think, how would I feel about other cultures, other religions? I am love. I am love. How would I think about that which is very different from me? I am love. How would I think? How would I feel about Republicans if I'm a Democrat, Democrats if I'm Republicans, Communists if I'm a conservative, Conservatives if I'm a Communist? Of course, if I am love, I will not go for schools of thought personally that bring divisions. But would I hate them? This is the question. Or would I have compassion for the state of consciousness 
that makes them feel that by divisions and by hatred and by bloodshed that good could come. This is the point. And this perhaps is the difference. If I, if someone close to me has a point of view, say that is in harmony with a school of thought that would say in essence, well, the establishment is, is full of evil and full of hate and full of injustice, and so I'm going to destroy it. Now think for a moment. Would love be out to do things like that or feel that way? Love needs to be able to recognize reality. In fact, only love is able to recognize reality because when you love, when you really love, you have no need, no reason to blind yourself. But if your loving has to do with the personality things of the world, like if your loving is dependent on whether personalities are going to react and respond to your ideas, then poverty stricken is the heart. Because then we can only love the qualities of people, whether we know it or not. And when we're loving the qualities, uh, you know, when love has an end, the one thing you can be sure of is it's going to end. Meditate on that. If it has an end, it's got to end. In other words, if love has a motive, sooner or later, it's gonna, it, that, that kind of loving it becomes a, a non-existent thing because it never was really existent to begin with, as a matter of fact. So that really loving, if I am love, I don't have to be dependent on whether you are anything one way or another politically, anything one way or another in your uh, attitudes towards all the various uh, controversial things of this world. I am full of my innerness with you. And I may not agree with your attitudes or points of view, but does that mean I have to stop loving you? Or if I stop loving you for any of these things, then I never loved you to begin with. You see, now all of us yearn to be loved more than we are. That's okay. <laughs> you know, you love me uh, as much as you say, all right, more, more. And what we really yearn for is to be accepted with all our foibles. But because we hate certain portions of our own being, and we all do, because we hate certain aspects of ourselves, we feel unlovable. And feeling unlovable, we project this out into the world. And of course, uh, when we project this unlovableness out into the world, we receive back what we're projecting always. You know, another thing we, we need to remember, that which we love is the thing that shapes our characters. And that's another very important point we need to bring and take home with us. Whatever it is that we love will shape our characters. For example, suppose we just love whodunits. A lot of people do. Now, if we love whodunits, and most of us do, times anyway, just think, we're putting attention on, on murder mysteries, for example, with the desire to find out, well, who, uh, who's the culprit? And look at the concentrated, intense attention we are giving to a, an area of life that has to do with destruction and, uh, and uh, 
negative uh, negative orientations and an awful lot of emotion goes into it. Some people wonder how come we have so much more expression of violence in our cultural uh, societies, especially in this country and a few other countries right now. It's obvious. We have permitted uh, the uh, entertainment media as well as the news media to keep presenting our consciousness with these images of violence. And you know how uh, attentive, excitedly attentive we become whenever there, ha there has anything, whenever anything is brought into our uh, immediate vicinity of consciousness. You know how attentive we become when it has to do with uh, something violent some kind of violent conduct. We become hypnotized, fascinated. Now, anything we concentrate on uh, with that kind of fascination, do you realize we are feeding it? We are actually feeding it with our consciousness so that all of us, every single one of us, have made and we do make some contribution to the violence of the world, even those of us who are so peace-loving. And most of us are very peace-loving. We all make some contribution. Every time we hate, we've made some contribution to the hates of the world. Every time we condemn, and with, with intensity, I'm talking about intensity of feeling, we have made a contribution. And that's why those who have gone through the very rigid trainings in this Kabbalistic tradition have developed that true humility where they can say with Jesus, come, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Now, when we are truly meek and lowly of heart, it's because we have seen the weaknesses within our own personality structure is not as something just us, but as being part of the immature levels of all humanity, and we are not separated from it. We do not sit holier than thou, saying, you have the capacity to do things that are evil, and I am an angel of heaven because I would never do a thing like that. You know, in occultism, we say never, say never, especially with that kind of emotion. Because the minute you put the emotion, I would never do anything like that, there's an image of what you'd never do. But the point is the image is there charged with emotion. So just think, what is it that we're making ourselves at one with? Just like that. You see, perhaps we might say the greatest difference between becoming love as God is love and still being lost in the la labyrinth, the mire of separatism is in thinking we're not capable of anything. This is the acme of separation because we think of ourselves as being more highly evolved, more mighty, better, more wonderful, more beautiful, uh, more of all of these things. And the result is, you know, we have within our own consciousness a spiritual pecking order. Like, like you know, the birds and the chickens is this pecking order. And every, each, each creature has its, its special spot, and the strongest knows that it can peck everybody. And the, the next strongest can be pecked only by the strongest, and then it pecks everybody else, and they don't dare you know, you know, do anything about it until finally you have the last, the one that can be pecked by everybody. So you have, yeah, and you know, it's an interesting thing. All creatures usually go in for this pecking order. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. 
Well, in the same way, we make a sort of spiritual pegging order. And so we sit around feeling very holy. Oh, so holy. <laughs> As we start to peck at those who aren't as spiritual as I am. And we say, oh, that how can they be like that? Boy, they have a long way to go meaning before they're as highly evolved as I am. <laughs> this is what you call the spiritual pecking order. <laughs> Jesus said, come, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Do you know what being love is? It's being less than anybody. Not in terms of the pecking order as we understand it, but in the recognition that, if, if you want to think of it as the spiritual pecking order, in the recognition that I, in my personality self, am as capable of anything as anybody else, given the conditions, given the situation, you know, Khalil Gibran says in The Prophet that we love to pass our laws, you know, and decide uh, what justice is and should be, but what justice do we mete out? He mentions somewhere in his book, The Prophet. What justice do we mete out to the one who actually more or less pressured the the criminal into the act of criminality. In other words, suppose I m march around and walk around, you know, nobly saying, gosh, I never had love, nobody loved me, which I did. I did. All right. This is what I was saying to life. How guiltless am I in the fact that certain people didn't love me or acted towards me in certain ways? Did I not make it necessary for them? Am I therefore not more the aggressor in that act by forcing them to project back to me, I, with my capacity to feel sorry for myself? A genius, a genius. I tell you, I brag about my genius here and now. Nobody could have been better at feeling sorry for themselves than I could. I was magnificent at it. <laughs> How could anyone resist? They had to respond back. So if I had to lead a loveless life for a while, who caused it? Was it that I was so cruel and evil? No, it's because I was so stupid. <laughs> and you know, ignorance, ignorance. This is the greatest problem. And of course, the one thing I like to point out to you is I did, thank God, thank God, whatever we do out of ignorance, we're go you know, However young we are, the one thing we can be sure of is that we're going to grow older, <laughs> more experienced, less areas of ignorance. That is the love of God. The fact that inevitably and inexorably we were, will outgrow our ignorance. Isn't that fantastically marvelous? Just think of that. Now that's the thing to rejoice in. God so loves humanity, the begotten, which is us, that God as humanity enters into a time and space evolutionary cycle for aspects of selfhood so that we have to grow whether we like it or not. <laughs> now that's love without condemnation without having to have a pecking order, <laughs> a spiritual pecking order. 
seeing all as needing the experience that brings the capacity to love. And to the degree, my beloved ones, that we start seeing this unity of all life, and this is truly a unity to the degree that we see it, we start to see also then that the only happiness there is in this world, the only real happiness, is to develop, to have, and to keep the capacity to love. Because remember, if we stop carrying that bull about, you know, and I'm not giving you a lot of bull either. <laughs> We're going to lose the power of those spiritual muscles, the, the muscles that love. The only way we strengthen them is by using them. And so when Jesus asked his disciple, lovest thou me? The disciple said, of course you know I love you. Lovest thou me? You know I love you. Lovest thou me? Oh, for God's sake, didn't I marry you? <laughs> That's what a husband might say to his wife. <laughs> Lovest thou me? And finally, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. What is the capacity to love? It's having so much of this nurturing love in ourselves that we nourish the lambs of God. And aren't we all the lamb? The sl we're all the, sl uh, you know, you might say the crucified. This is what it means, the slaughtering the lamb of God. We are the lamb of God. You know, certainly there's this crucifixion, but remember uh, what we pointed out Misfortune is not punishment from God. Matter of fact, it even says in the Bible, uh, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And although I've been in, as I've told you before, I've been in certain situations where I wish God would stop being so in love with me. <laughs> you, know, you know, this is just a little too much. And, and perhaps I may even still say, look, God, stop loving me so much and just let me stay, let me rest here in peace a little bit. <laughs> Uh, that, of course, it would just be one aspect of the personality which uh, it is natural to have. We always want to escape pain. It is natural as we should. Still, there is a depth of being within us, a true depth of being, that in us which is the spark of God, which knows, and it knows even when it doesn't know, it knows it. This depth of being, this spark within us that is part of that divine flame, it knows that only when we are loving, that is, from within out, only then are we in a state of magic, real magic, wonderment. When I feel love, that's when I'm in a state of cosmic, union of the most unspeakably glorious and ineffable kind. Not, mind you, when I'm being loved, though this is wonderful. Oh, God, that's wonderful, delightful. No doubt about it. But that isn't an, an, the acme of experience at all. The true acme of experience is to be in a state of loving from within out. A true state now, mind you, when we're out to buy love, and all, all of us at times try to buy it, of course, not everybody can be as fortunate or as good at it. You know, you have to be born with a knack. Like, for example, I was able to buy my husband. And believe me, that took talent, real talent. And a good bargain besides, two bucks, two dollars. You know, my property. I paid for the license out of my own pocketbook. <laughs> you know, for my property. Not everybody can be that fortunate. <laughs> you know, as I said, you have to develop a little knack, but that's still uh, just one portion of beingness. The, the thing that I certainly was not able to buy was the kind of lovingly, lovingness he has the capacity to give. See, what I bought is... Uh, well, everything I can get, you know, my property there. <laughs> yeah. And incidentally, he's in trouble. Uh, you think that's not loving. It's 
very loving. He has to be in trouble. I have to give him more joy <laughs> in developing the capacity not to forget Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Here, he found a beautiful card in the drawer where we keep apples, because we have uh, raw apple juice every day, you know, with a nice raw lemon in it. And in the card there, there was a ca the card had a beautiful apple, and it said, can I tempt you? <laughs> <laughs> to be my valentine on the inside. Well, <laughs> now that I've teased him and all of us, which I need to do for all of us, whenever we're talking about something that has profound significance, we have to have enough laughter in between or our hearts can't accept it, you know. It's a very important part of teaching. That's why Jesus had to tell so many parables. We have to be able to chuckle and then we become receptive. Uh, we have to be able to chuckle at our own little weaknesses. Otherwise, we haven't got enough power and strength uh, to want to uh, develop uh, beyond these weaknesses. Only as we see that together we have these sort of poignant little clumsinesses and that we're not alone in them. Only then do we have enough courage to go after it. Otherwise, we waste our energies uh, fighting with something that you can't fight. See, the only thing that overcomes everything is love, and it does. The capacity to love is like the inexorable waters, that no matter how many dams you build, if the waters keep flowing from the ocean, always they will, f over, they will flood. They will break any dam finally, and they'll finally flood over and take over. And this Loving, true loving, the capacity to love is like that. It overcomes everything. Now, when I say it overcomes everything, I'm not talking about the expectations that too many people usually have. I'm talking about that part of our lives that keeps us able to say, I thank you, Lord of the universe, for the capacity to be aware. I thank you, Lord of the universe, for the capacity to see, to touch, to hear, to feel, to taste, to do, to experience, to be. I thank thee, Lord of the universe, for the capacity to be, and I thank thee, Lord of the universe, for developing in me more and more of a capacity to give. It has to do with being able to walk with a heart flowing with gratitude. And you know, no matter how much gratitude you can flow with, it, can, it pours from the infinite reservoir because gratitude is a w another way of talking about love. Because when you love someone, there's a continuous overflow of gratitude for the presence of that. For instance, I look at that gorgeous, beautiful, fantastic, unspeakably ineffable miracle, Jacob. And I, I look at it and I say, my God, my God, just look at that. <laughs> yeah, look at it. And do you know why I can say that? Now, is his personality so perfect? Well, if I thought it wasn't, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> you see what I mean? And you better not say anything. Maybe I will, but you better not. <laughs> because, you see, I don't trust you to be able to love him with a, any weakness of personality. I can trust me to love him if he has a weakness of personality, which, mind you, he hasn't, even if I have to lie through my teeth. <laughs> well, in other words, even something that others might say is an imperfection, as far as I'm concerned, I thank you, Lord of the universe. 
So he has six planets in fixed sign, and it takes a little longer to get him uh, moving. Gee, thank you, Lord of the Universe. Just think, suppose I'd had that emptiness of not having him to push. <laughs> you see what love is? And when you are without it, just think of the emptiness. You see, because I have been lowly evolved enough to grow and grow lovelessness in my life, where I have been more utterly alone than aloneness, and I have been more empty than the infinite void of space, where I have been more hopeless than the most veritable fiend or drug addict, where life was so meaningless that I determined to end it. Now this is really being emptied and with nothing. And perhaps it's because of just this, having had the privilege of this kind of lack in my consciousness, which made it essential to be a part of my environment for a time. It's because of the privilege of having had this, that I can say to you, beloved, beloved children of my heart and soul, that we must all stop looking for love. It isn't going to work, not if you look at it in the bigger picture. Stop hitting yourselves over the head because you're not appreciated. It doesn't matter. No one can be in a state where everyone will appreciate them. Of course, we can always say it's their problem when they don't, and it's true. <laughs> Let's stop hunting for love and the meaning of love in the wrong areas. It doesn't exist there. We walk in magic and we walk in beauty. We walk in fulfillment and we walk in God and with God. When we want only one thing, and no matter how much we have, we want it more, and that is the capacity to love. And when, when we want it so much that we practice this loving, when even in the midst of an inability to feel anything, we say to ourselves, I love you, God, I love you, God. When even when we are in a despair where we look out and the world looks dark, we say, thank you, God, for light, thank you for light. Reaching, reaching. When in the midst of anything, what we keep reaching for is the capacity to love and to feel grateful where whatever we look upon, the little bird or the tree or the sky, the ground, the human being, the pet, the, the condition, man, no matter what, where we train ourselves to say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. Only so can we finally open up something in ourselves which will become an in-loveness, where finally we will experience, because by reaching for it, by carrying that calf around, we will develop in ourselves a capacity to be so grateful, a capacity to be so full of love, that we'll marvel at the time when we were so infantile that we wept asking and begging God to find somebody to give us love or companionship or things or comforts. We'll marvel that we were so young and we'll say, ah, I see, I see. Fulfillment is the capacity to be love. I am love. My darlings, you are love. You are love.
because I see it. You are love incarnate because every time I look into your eyes and heart, I see and I experience it. Become aware of it by practicing it. I am love. You are love. We are love. What else is there to want? We'll continue with the service.